through the early stages of my legal career, I began integrating, or I should say interacting with people who kind of thought like me in the legal space. Some degree I thought I was alone and thought I was crazy, but as you start to network, you realize there are some people who kind of share that same vision. This episode of the Bloomex podcast is brought to you by MCRO, who enables businesses to grow through handcrafted digital solutions of the future. MCRO is a web and mobile app development studio with a competent, dedicated, and experienced team focused on solving business challenges through fast-to-market and high-performance digital products. If you're looking to turn your disruptive ideas into reality or have a reliable strategic par tech partner, to explore options for your existing work, reach out to Henry Yu from MCRO for a chat over coffee or a bone shaker IPA, your choice. Thank you for joining us. Um, you're interesting because you're from the legal background, you're mm -hmm. a lawyer, and a lawyer start, uh, getting into a startup, that's, that's interesting, <laughs> right? So you're having a startup within the legal space, ex, uh, exploring a key problem set mm -hmm. with Minutebox. So bring up your site. So you're trying to automate away physical minute books mm -hmm. by providing a digital solution. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about that. So what, are, what is uh, minute books and uh, what do you do to change that industry? Yeah, it's a really great question. Um, so a minute book is a collection of data or information that pretty much every company has associated with them. So when you incorporate a company, there are documents that come with and most of the time they're things that people won't even consider things like their articles, their bylaws, share certificates. Um, and throughout the life of the company, while this information is supposed to be updated, most of the time it's not. Uh, for the most part, they sit typically in physical binders sitting on law firm shelves, uh, and they just collect dust. And for certain reasons, you may need to access it for things like raising capital, or um, you're selling your company, or yeah. even when the CRA comes calling for tax reasons. Mm -hmm. But by law, this information is supposed to be updated annually. So myself as a former corporate lawyer, I need to find a minute book. But working in a big law firm, it was in a room filled with 10,000 other minute books. Mm -hmm. uh, and so just finding a physical book, uh, finding the information within it, updating it accordingly, became very, very tedious. Uh, multiply that based on the number of books that a law firm can have, and you can understand a lot of the efficiency. So even though most of the minute books are predominantly physical, we also deal with pre-digitized information, and it becomes a central cloud-based solution where you can search and share and edit and eventually update all of your minute book documents in a very seamless way. So it reduces the efficiency per book and makes everyone's life a heck of a lot easier when dealing with pretty tedious stuff. Yeah, definitely. I can imagine. So is there any other solutions like this? In the market space, like, w w like, is it? So the idea of a virtual minute book or collection of information mm -hmm. isn't anything new. But if you look at the technologies that have existed over the last 30 years, so I'd say a lot of the legacy pieces um, have been around for a very long time. Many of them developed on things like DOS or even Windows 95. Um, what has happened as a result is you've got law firms that are still holding on to physical minute books and then a digital data set that they would find likely on an on-prem solution. And you can imagine as you update one, you don't necessarily update the other. So what used to be a solution to integrate all of the data together, suddenly now comes what we call a hybrid system. Um, and it becomes far more tedious now to update two systems when the client's only paying you one fee. Okay, okay. So, like, automation is happening, like, like software is eating the world, mm -hmm. right? This is what we hear all the time. Oh, yeah. Um, like, were you the first person to get into this? Like, what was the process like? So let's get back into you, the person, right? Sure. The founder. Um, you, you're a lawyer, mm -hmm. right? And you decided to get, you were working at Osler. Yes. Right. You started from Osler from being an intern, work your way up to an associate. Exactly. And uh, what was the process like? How do you decide to go from, like, Osler is a pretty good law firm. Oh, it was a great firm. Yeah. Great people, great and culture. Like, to like, I want to go solve this problem. Mm -hmm. Where did that happen? So. I suppose since I was six years old, my dream was to always go to law school and become a lawyer. Uh, okay. This was the goal I had set for myself, not because I come from a family of lawyers, but because I thought this is something I want to do. Yeah. Um, and everything I did in terms of undergraduate, um, in terms of my school in, in high school, extracurriculars, everything was with this one fundamental focus. And I was so excited when I got into law school. Um, but at the same time, I thought, you know, I, I want to be a business lawyer, not really understanding what that meant. So about halfway through, I decided to do uh, a joint MBA program with my degree at McGill Law School. Mm -hmm. um, and it turned my three and a half year degree into a five year degree and gave me that level of education and business background that I probably wouldn't have had 
or been exposed to it in any other way. But at the same time, I still thought this will just help me become a better business lawyer. And then towards the end of um, my school career, I had to write a paper. Um, and it could have been on anything I wanted to, and I, I decided to focus on the changing Canadian legal industry. So that was around 2013 and 2014, when we had a major Canadian law firm uh, that just bottomed out, a firm called Heenan Blakey. And as a result, you had a whole bunch of lawyers who were highly educated, highly trained, suddenly looking for jobs. Now, they all found uh, the Canadian market was able to absorb all of them, so that wasn't a real issue. But the question that was in the back of my mind is, why did this happen? So in researching this paper, I did a heck of a lot of research on, on the industry itself, more so than the work that lawyers did, and I, I just became fascinated by it. So when I started practicing, uh, after I had finished school, I looked at the industry a little bit differently than perhaps some of my colleagues did, mm -hmm. and I really fell in love with the business side. Okay. How does a law firm run? How does this thing, um, which is an incredible business on the outside, actually function internally? Everything from billable hour models to the interaction with clients to even the space that you're leasing. All of that needs to be registered in terms of costs and revenues, etc. And that to me became, like I said, far more interesting than the work I did as a corporate associate. Um, and through the early stages of my legal career, I began integrating, or I should say interacting with people who kind of thought like me in the legal space. Some degree I thought I was alone and thought I was crazy, but as you start to network, you realize there are some people who kind of share that same vision. Uh, and that eventually led me to, uh, to making the decision that I want to be a part of the change in the legal space as opposed to just continuing as a regular lawyer. But I think there was one moment where I just thought, this is probably not for me. It was in the first year of my career, and Osler being a, a great firm, we tend to do a lot of the deals that would appear uh, in the Globe and Mail, for example, and there's a whole bunch of those. But one of my colleagues from the first year said, uh, Sean, you'll never guess what, I'm working on this billion dollar deal. And word for word, I said to her, I spent the day watching the Blue Jays game in my office. I wasn't busy that day. And you and I made the same amount of money. Um, I was happy doing what I was doing watching the game. And, and I realized that there are some people who are passionate about what they do uh, in the legal space. And I also realized that would never be me. Mm. So for me, this was an opportunity to continue in the industry I love, but allow the lawyers who are seasoned and passionate about it to focus on that element, where I can try and find something new in the grandiose legal space. That's really interesting because you didn't want to be a lawyer since you were age of six, so working the space and understanding how, what the actual minutiae of the workload mm -hmm. and what it's actually doing is, and you're like, hey, it might not be for me. <laughs> um, so right from the beginning, what was it about the legal field that interested you? Like, you want to be a lawyer, was it because you wanted those, those skill sets to do further business? Mm -hmm. um, was it a power motive where you, like, you saw this a powerful kind of role? Mm -hmm. um, what was the attraction to the legal field? I think first and foremost, it was a good job. Yeah. Um, high level of pay, high level of respect, uh, opportunity for you to grow. Um, something that always stuck in the back of my mind that I've heard from a number of people, they always used to say, if you have a law degree, you can do anything, which is very true. But for the most part, you're trained to be a lawyer. It's up to the individual then to take those skill sets and transform them to something that's different. Yep. Um, it's both exciting in that you can make it in whatever it is you would like, but also a little bit of a risk. Mm -hmm. um, if you go through the, the sort of lockstep system such that you can become an associate at a firm of whatever size and eventually become a partner and have a very successful practice, it's fairly easy, all things considered, even though today it's becoming a little bit more difficult. The path is, for the most part, laid out for you. But for me, for example, coming from both a business and legal background in school, uh, the good news is that um, there was no fixed system. The bad news is there was no fixed system for me to abide by. So I, it took me a little time to find where it was I fit in with this particular skill sets, while at the same time trying to find something that made me happy. No, definitely. Um, so that's a very succinct um, answer to that <laughs> to the question. Uh, like, so getting back into the legal industry, yeah. right? I think it's interesting you, you mentioned this, but you learn these particular skill sets, but it's up to the person to utilize the degree, the actual knowledge base and all that. I, I was talking to another professional from this, uh, he's a CPA, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. And uh, he was mentioning the same kind of concept, these professionals mm -hmm. who go and get these degrees and just do the actual workload mm -hmm. and that's it. Yep. They don't use it as a stepping stone to understand it from a business sense, right? Using it as like a filter to understand how businesses work, what kind of problems that they may have. Mm -hmm. Um, so he was a CPA and as he was doing audits for these companies, the major companies, he was like, I have access to your entire C-suite of people. I can ask you all these questions. Why don't I? And he's like looking at line items and saying, okay, wh why'd you, what was your decision of spending this this way? Mm -hmm. Why not this way? Like, what were you doing here? Yeah. 
And he would take that point to go and problems, like problem, not problem solve, but I guess naturally curious mm -hmm. about the operational, uh, the operational, um, I guess, uh, the way they operate, like figuring out why they make the decisions they did. Mm -hmm. And to ask this high level CEOs, CFOs, operations people, or within the companies, how do they run? Mm -hmm. And not a lot of people do that, right? Were you like that? Were you, were you using your legal background like, did you have, was it naturally curious in the business side of things? Like, yeah. I wouldn't say I had a laser focus when I started realizing that things were, were changing around the legal space. I, I didn't really know where I fit in, and I didn't even know where to start probing. What I started to do was just reading a few books, reading a few blogs, um, and I got a little bit more into some of the mechanics of how things run. Mm -hmm. And that led to a number of conversations within people within the law firm to ask them a little bit more about uh, leadership in terms of those decisions that they were making. And I discovered a whole bunch of different things in terms of, depending on which firm or, or the individual I was speaking at, uh, when it comes to, for example, uh, the revenue scheme versus the number or the costs that are associated with bringing in clients, either current clients or new clients for uh, engagement contracts. And that really got me thinking that there may not be necessarily the level of understanding uh, about what's happening in, in what is ultimately a very large and very successful organization. I mean, these law firms have been around for quite some time and have been incredibly successful. But the question was, were they optimal, were they running at their highest level of optimization or they were just making more money than they were losing uh, and therefore that's the, um, the metric for success. Mm -hmm. And the answer to that question really varies depending on who you're speaking to, which firm you're at. Um, naturally, everyone wants to think that their business is successful. But I think if you probe a little bit deeper uh, and start to get into those really intimate questions, there's always some doubt that perhaps things could be, doing, or be done uh, a little bit better. Now, I have never had the chance to, seek, uh, to, to take a look at any law firm's balance sheets, and I would love the opportunity to do that one day just to see whether or not my assumptions are anywhere yeah. in the ballpark of what's right. Um, but I imagine, based, like I said, the conversations I have, it's not too far out there to realize that uh, certainly in some firms, it may not be as uh, cut and dry or as, as um, um, profitable or successful as perhaps it could be, despite the fact that there's an individual level of success in all of them. Yeah, definitely. So I want to get back to this concept of like software eating the world, yeah. right? And one of the case examples of this was what happened, what was going to happen in the legal industry, mm -hmm. right? So you were an articling student as well. Yes. And it, it, I think 90, uh, the fact or figure I, I was reading was like, what, 90% or 80% of the workload of a first year, like, um, a lawyer, mm -hmm. I guess, working in a firm is pretty much articling, yeah. right? Or um, and figuring out this kind of casework, I guess, <laughs> right? Um, for on, on behalf of the firm, yeah. and that's where most of the time goes. And when um, I think IBM Watson came out, like one of the main case examples for it was that you can automate the entire process. Yeah. And it became to be that you know what? It's these big law firms now no longer need this pool of like first year associates, first year lawyers mm -hmm. anymore because software kind of automates most of the process and run lean. And uh, it came to be that like a lot of lawyers lost jobs or couldn't find jobs. Mm -hmm. But it also came, a, came to a capability that uh, a smaller law firm can now act like a larger law firm. Exactly. As it came capabilities. Exactly. So what ended up happening is a lot of these law firms, they, even though originally they, they became, become very lean and operate very efficiently for a minute, for a while, a lot of those professionals leave those kind of firms mm -hmm. and start their own mm -hmm. because it's easier to now. Of course. Yeah. And it happens a lot in these professional industries. Yep. So like even like the big four accounting firms, mm -hmm. there's a huge problem. They, the, the brain drain, right? People come in, learn the stuff, and like, oh, I can just do it myself. That's right. So do you see that a lot happening in the legal industry now where these big firms are just losing talent to people who are like, I can mm -hmm. just take all this software existing out here mm -hmm. and operate almost like a larger firm? Mm -hmm. right? Have you seen that? Well, there, there's a lot in that, and I'll try and dissect it as best I can. So the short answer is yes. Yeah. There is a buzz in the legal space of people who can do things that they weren't able to do in the past, mm -hmm. can now do it easier, more efficiently, and as a result, for lack of a better word, can punch above their belt in terms of the service they're offering for the clients. In the past, if you had a big deal, or you, the only solution was to use a big law firm because they can throw as many people mm. as needed to do it. And certain technologies, for example, have now made things like uh, research using IBM's Watson, mm -hmm. or in the case of the company which is surrounding it called Ross, uh, or for purposes like due diligence on the corporate and transactional side, where instead of reviewing thousands of contract uh, contracts by an individual or a series of individuals, now a machine can do it very, very quickly. So there is a new kind of learning that's happening for the junior associates, and certainly myself when I was there was slowly being integrated into it. Um, 
And the reality is it's going to require a little bit of time to determine what skill sets the future lawyers will actually need given these new changes in technology. So it's not like we're ever going to go back to the way things were. But that doesn't mean we're not going to need highly educated, highly motivated individuals to now integrate with these new technologies and develop new skill sets in order to bring value for their clients in the large law firms. Yeah. So there'll always be a need for the large law firms, uh, medium size and even smaller sizes. But there has to be a little bit of a rethinking of what sort of value they themselves offer to their clients, because that's going to be what ensures that clients stick around in the long run. You always used to have, well, I should say in the last 20 years, you've had um, opportunities where people have gone from one firm to the next. And perhaps now it's happening a little bit more frequently. Uh, and some people, for a whole bunch of reasons, want to get out of the private legal game for work-life balance, et cetera. So it's imperative that the law firms find out what their, what their lawyers are actually looking for in terms of their career so they can find ways in order to retain them. But the reality is, um, as I'm a firm believer of technology being integrated into the legal space as opposed to technology replacing the work that lawyers do. Um, because things like artificial intelligence, automation, it's not nearly at the level that we often think we are. And I think there might be just a little bit of alarmism from more seasoned lawyers thinking, oh no, my, my job is now, um, is now completely um, unnecessary. Mm -hmm. But there is an element of what they used to do, sort of a disaggregation of some of the uh, services they used to offer their clients that clients are no longer willing to pay for. So I think both at the law school level and the law firm level, they need to take a step back and think, okay, what is it that I as an individual lawyer can offer this client? And if the answer is such that nobody else can offer them. And if the answer is nothing, well, that requires a little bit of a rethink. But if you can identify something that you as an individual or as a firm can offer them, then no matter what level of technology you introduce, you've actually been able to cement yourself in your position as that um, advisor role. Uh, to the client. So much more than a lawyer-client relationship, more one of peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. And I think that's the sweet spot that law firms and individual lawyers need to eventually be able to zero in. And if they can't, well, it'll be interesting to see how, how the industry changes as a result. Yeah. So let's, get, let's digest that for a minute because you, you mentioned that thing about what clients are no longer willing to pay for, mm -hmm. right? So what has changed in that aspect? What are, what are clients saying that, like, you know what, we don't need this? or? Yeah they have out-of-box solutions they can use? Like, yeah. What's going on? So it, it's a great question. And up until I would say the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, it was very much a price maker sort of market where law firms were able to say, look, you have a big deal uh, coming up or you have a big litigation, uh, or even if you don't, this is how it's going to be done. We're the best. Therefore, we charge whatever we did. And this isn't specific to Canada. This is really all over the world. Yeah. Uh, and then what happened was following the financial crisis, you had a lot of clients saying, we can't actually afford to outsource all of this work to law firms externally, and they started to swell their in-house ranks. So you'll see, for example, large organizations that now have the capacity of major law firms. That mm -hmm. was just in terms of people. Now with the introduction of new technology, those same people can do a lot of what the large law firms could have done in the first place. That doesn't mean they could do it as well, but for the purposes of what they need, they can certainly do it at a far reduced cost than what the large law firms have done. So clients are now saying, look, we're able to work with, um, instead of you know, 50 law firms, we can only work with 25, which means it's a lot more competitive now on the RFP process. Law firms got to have to get a little bit more creative showing what they as, in, what they as, as industry leaders can now offer clients, because clients can simply go somewhere else or do something internally. So that goes back to that whole value proposition. At the same time, the new technologies are now cheaper and can be integrated in some cases with uh, in-house counsels. They can manage their own affairs. So uh, the value needs to be a little bit more specific in terms of what law firms can offer because clients are now pushing back. There were things that they needed to accept in the past that now they're saying, we need to do things a little bit differently. And it's imperative for both clients and law firms to discuss what those things actually are so they can ensure the most harmonious relationship moving forward. Great. So I guess moving forward with like, how law firms are going to interact with, with each other. Do you see like a like a pure play technology play that can that can solve most of the of the workload that you do? Because we see like small things like incorporation, for example. Mm -hmm. Now there are automated tools mm -hmm. that just do it for you automatically. Yeah. And companies like I think RBC just bought uh, a company recently for I don't know how much. Uh, I just lost some. But it's basically a tool that automates the entire incorporation process. Yep. I incorporate my company, get part of the incorporation, all that. Mm -hmm. Something a, a, a law firm will charge anywhere from three hundred to five thousand dollars for is now yep. automated. Yeah. And the, we've seen the pure play, like actual actual uh, things that the law firms traditionally do, mm -hmm. being automated away. But you see, like a holistic, like I guess a 
technology or solution provider mm -hmm. that can do most of what a law firm does as a technology. So I think this is where my experience as a lawyer comes out more than just an entrepreneur. Having gone through the ranks of law school, having looked at, in some cases, uh, you know, thousands of minute books when I was um, a lawyer and contracts and agreements, whereas the output may seem simple, for example, just producing a one-page contract, the input and understanding all the specific components associated with that is more complicated than we like to think. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a huge proponent and, and advocate for lawyers being able to do legal stuff and I still think that that's something that in large part should remain in their hands. If for no other reason than someone engaging it by themselves may not understand the consequences of the language they're using. The example I often give is, um, if I were to give you the tools, and uh, sometimes this is you know, thrown back in my face in the wrong way, but if I were to give you the tools in a YouTube video on how to tune up your car <laughs> and told you you had to do it annually, would you do it? Yeah. Should you do it? Most people would say absolutely not. And for a lot of legal work, especially if it needs to be done annually, people think, well, all they're producing is a one-page document. I can do that, uh, and therefore I should do that. I have issue with that because if you get it wrong, you may not be able to realize until it's too late, and mm -hmm. it'll cost you tens of thousands of dollars to rectify. So I'm not a huge proponent of removing lawyers from the process at all. In fact, I think they have a huge value in terms of getting legal work done properly. What I am an advocate for is giving them the right tools so clients can see their value. So even though new solutions are being introduced um, for the purpose of bypassing lawyers altogether, um, I still don't think a lot of them serve the long-term purpose of what the client actually needs. And there's an education component because in many ways the client may not know what it is they actually need. Um, but I also don't think that law firms are doing things that won't provide any value whatsoever to the client. I still think that relationship needs to be there um, because a good lawyer can be preventative as opposed to one that's reactive. Uh, in other words, be able to prevent problems that will come up as opposed to only solving problems once they're, once they're put in front of you because that situation is a lot more expensive than people may think. Yeah, definitely. Like, I think there's also the specialization of law firms now, right? right? Like a lot of boutique firms mm -hmm. are coming up. Mm -hmm. Um, where they hyper specialize in a particular area. So, like, we a law firm where we, where we focus on film, right, and production, yep. right, and like the, the, all the, all the minutia of, of mm -hmm. that. Well, that's all we do, mm -hmm. right? Uh, someone else will be doing music, right? Uh, I think Dave, Dave, David from um, YSpace were talking about how there's lawyers now for gaming. Oh, yeah, right? absolutely. And, Which uh, I think is awesome, by the way. This yeah. is so cool. Yeah. So do you see that happening more in the space where like these boutique law firms go to specific niches and they focus on that? Um, or do you see like a bigger player emerging once again or a few major players coming mm -hmm. up? So like, it was a question that the industry uh, was trying to predict. What's going to happen in Canada? We had a few global law firms that sort of set up space here. Things, uh, sorry, firms you may realize like Norton Rose or Dentons are actually global players. And we thought what would happen is they would take over the entire Canadian market, leaving all of what we deem to be our large national law firms in a little bit of trouble. Now, it turns out it didn't play out like that. And right now, everything seems to be working out, for the most part, harmoniously. Um, but that doesn't mean there aren't specific areas that are emerging that a few years ago we didn't even think was an area of law that needed to focus on. Things like cannabis, things like gaming, film and television that you had mentioned. Uh, and every year we're getting new spaces. A blockchain was a huge one. Everyone became a blockchain lawyer with 99% yeah. of people not yeah. understanding what it was. Uh, so I definitely see focus as we, as a huge society, start developing new technologies and ideas and industries uh, that lawyers will want to undertake specific and niche focuses. Because if you, again, can establish yourself as the authority in this space, well, suddenly you'll be able to be as successful, perhaps even more successful, than your experience working in a medium or large size law firm. Um, so certainly the large law firms will manage just about everything, but these niche boutiques will be able to offer just as much in terms of value and service as what those large law firms would be able to offer in this specific niche. So personally, I think it's fabulous. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you find that more and more lawyers are, are starting their own firms? I don't know if, if they're actually starting. I'd love to see the numbers. Um, I think a lot of lawyers have thought about it. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a lot of the reason why certainly many of the lawyers that I've spoken with won't do it, is there's a lot of administrative costs. When you work at a big firm, really everything's taken care of for you. Um, you know, you've got your own assistant, you've got clerks, you've got uh, um, someone to handle payroll. 
When you go out and branch out by yourself, regardless of how big and, and how seasoned the firm may be, there's a lot of intricacy and nitty gritty and, and just a boring admin stuff that people may not want to deal with. And oftentimes these are the things that can sink the ship if they're not done properly. So the opportunity cost may not be that great such that people would be willing to do it. Um, but I think those that are willing and have a particular niche are the ones that will be the most successful in the future. Awesome. So let's dive back into Minute Box. Yeah, sure. Up. There we go. Great. So, starting minute block again from from your background, mm -hmm. you understood that there's, there's a problem set. You wanted to go and fix it. So, what like was it this problem that stuck out to you? Like I'm gonna go solve this, or was it because you like you want I want to move out of the legal industry and you went and found a problem? It was definitely more the latter. It was uh, there's so much that's. Um, very archaic in what's done in the legal space, mm -hmm. I got to try and find something that's a little bit different. Um, I think the epiphany moment for things focused on minute books was it was late at night, about 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and uh, I had a, either my assistant or um, a clerk bring over something like 40 or 50 minute books that were devoted to one company, and I needed to find one resolution to see it signed. Um, and I thought to myself, if only I could just click Control F and go through all of these minute books to find the specific thing I'm looking for, I could save the client tens of thousands of dollars and not have to waste anybody's time and I can go home and be less grumpy tomorrow. Yeah. We didn't have that at the time and so I had to go through the nitty gritty of finding what it was I needed to find. Fortunately, I found it, but can you imagine if I couldn't? The frustration that would set in. So it was really a specific annoyance at the time, which as I began probing a little bit deeper led to a better understanding of just how deep the pain points associated with minute book storage and maintenance actually are. So everything has been done the same way for generations from the storing of the physical binders um, to the database that's associated with them. And anytime you would ask a, a law firm or representatives of a law firm what they think about minute books, the answer was always the same. We hate them. Yeah. And, and that was the nice answer they would give me. Um, so clearly the solutions that were out there weren't identifying or solving the pain points whatsoever. In fact, in many cases, they were perpetuating them uh, in even worse ways. So we realized there's got to be a better way to deal with what is a very simple to understand pain point, but one that goes very deep. So you went on pretty much and found the deepest pain that everyone kind of kind of experienced. Yeah. And you're like, you know what, I'll solve that. Yeah. Um, is it is it a starting point to what you want to be doing? Like you want to start with this, expand it to other mm -hmm. things or is this like hyper specialization? You know, the focus is really focus yeah. on. That's a great question. So right now we recognize just how deep and, and robust this pain point is. Um, and by being so narrow focused, we can develop a great solution focused on just this. But at the same time, we're also conscious of all of the other verticals in terms of pain points that exist in the legal space and going beyond law firms, accounting firms, large corporations, et cetera, yep. recognizing that um, solutions devoted to the legal space are going to be incredibly robust. And uh, again, minute books are just one example of something that doesn't work in the legal space or uh, something that people want to see improved. Uh, we're very conscious and have our fingers on the pulse all the time on how we can make our platform and our company better by focusing on a whole bunch of different areas when the time is right. So, so what was the transition like from being a lawyer to a founder, right? Because do you have any experience with uh, software, running a software company? Like, how, 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 was that, how was that transition like for you? It sucked. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the only way I can describe it. There was a whole level of excitement about what it was I was trying to create, but I'm not a developer, I'm not an engineer. I approach this very much from the business, from the analytical side, and, and certainly on the sales and business development side, mm -hmm. and needed to find the right people yeah. to help turn this idea mm -hmm. into a reality. And uh, Part of the value that I had networked over the course of several years prior is that that connected me with a whole group of potentially interesting partners uh, that would like to solve the same problem I did. I'm very fortunate to have found two amazing co-founders uh, who are just as dedicated, focused, but also have that technical background to help turn our vision, and it was a joint vision, into an actual reality. So again, very fortunate on that side, but I'll tell you that the first year when you have just an idea um, and you've given up what ultimately is a, a very successful or lucrative job to chase after what you think is a dream in the best case scenario, realizing that there's so many reasons where this can fail, uh, a little bit of that reality was difficult, uh, just in terms of catching up on sleep and realizing there's a huge level of stress that's involved. But slowly now we're starting to see the, the seedlings start to sprout, uh, which is very exciting for us. And you and I were talking before realizing that there's also an element of luck behind everything we do as a company. And really it's not associated with 
uh, the idea or um, the business itself. It could be a whole bunch of other things that can derail you, most of which you can't even predict. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have avoided some of those pitfalls at the early stage. Uh, it doesn't mean we're not going to have a whole bunch of problems in the future. Uh, it just means that now we're, uh, we're all excited and moving forward about the direction we're in. So I don't think any amount of school or any amount of legal work could have prepared me for what it means to be an entrepreneur, yeah. especially one that now has to run his own business, dealing with things like payroll and insurance. But I can tell you in all honesty, uh, well, I can tell you two things. The first is I wouldn't give this up for anything in the world. Nice. Um, and the second thing is that you learn mighty quick uh, what it is you need to do because everything falls on your shoulders. And this is the first company you started? This is the first company I started. And what was the process like? What was your, what was your reaction from friends and family when you're like, hey, I'm leaving this nice, cushy legal career, mm -hmm. right? Where I just landed and just 34 and did all this schooling for mm -hmm. and doing that. What was everyone's reaction? So everyone's reaction was a little bit different. Um, the people, at, for example, in my law firm, for the most part, were very supportive. Uh, they knew my interests lie in, again, the business side of law as opposed to the legal. Uh, my dad, uh, he and I had spoken about this at quite some length, and, and he gave me the thumbs up, the A-OK. -okay. My mom started crying. Yeah. Uh, she, it was natural to be expected. See, she's the mom's uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. But her reason was funny. She said, well, what do I tell my friends now? Yep. I mean, my son doesn't want to be a lawyer anymore. And <laughs> when I tried to explain to her what it was we were doing at Minute Box, she said, uh, what the heck is Magic Box and why do I care? Like, mom, just chill out a bit. Um, we'll help you figure it out. There was uh, one lawyer I was working with. She was a friend of mine at the law firm. And she said, you know, Sean, well, she would tell me this pretty much all the time. She said, uh, you're self-centered, selfish, uh, highly funny. You know, she gave me a whole list of traits and she would do that time and time again. Yeah. But the last time I spoke with her before I left and she said, I'll never forget that she said, you might just be crazy enough to make this work. Nice. Which I, I really took to heart um, because it was identifying that something I was really passionate about and she knew that no matter what it took, I would be able to take it well, along with my team to the level it needed to be at so that we could be successful. Um, and it's something I'll never forget. But um, again, there are a lot of people who thought that I would follow the traditional legal path because I told them this is what I wanted to do. Uh, and they were very surprised to realize that I myself had found a new direction. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so let's talk about a little bit more about getting the functionality of this up. Mm -hmm. Was it more your co-founders who figured out, okay, we get your problem set, you understand, you understand the business, business model here, mm -hmm. cost structuring, all that kind of stuff, but how's it gonna look, how's it gonna feel, how's it gonna actually function? Mm -hmm. What was the conversation like? So, as a team, we're incredibly fortunate. Everything we've done from the website um, to our back end, to our front end, to our digital marketing is done internally. Yeah. And part of the value of our team is that we each bring something unique. We're all lawyers, so <laughs> we have pain or we have understanding of the pain point going through uh, everything that we're trying to sell to law okay. firms. So if nothing else, uh, we can't go into a law firm such that and be surprised when they say, uh, you don't understand my problem. Believe me, I mm -hmm. understand it. And we can get past that conversation to something of real value. Um, but at the same time, they've also built pieces of technology in the past. Uh, they understand project management, they understand digital marketing, uh, and they understand web design such that they created for us a really amazing website. So these are things obviously that have helped us reduce our costs because we don't have to outsource, yep. but at the same time we all have the same vision. We all know in the end what we want a solution to actually offer and how we want it to look. Definitely. So by being so laser focused and bringing all our individual experiences such that we can create something as a team that's really great is... Um, is great. It's certainly fantastic to have um, in terms of putting out a really great product. Definitely. Yeah, because like you have biometric and hardware key authentication. Um, that's, that's to securitize the data and things like that. Absolutely. And that's heavy, like that's a lot of back-end work that's required. Right. That's right. And you're exclusively a three-person team right now. We're a team of six you, now. You're six? Um, and if you took a look on Betakit, what we just posted, yeah. um, I think earlier this week, was we had announced the acquisition that here right now. There we go. So you acquired uh, another co company called Conductor? Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, and along with it brought on the, um, uh, the head engineer named Brian Hunt, who is now our CTO. Okay. He himself has experience on building some of the world's most secure uh, cybersecurity and privacy networks. He himself is also a lawyer. Yeah. Uh, so he's able to Amazing. All these lawyers are doing great things. Fabulous. Yeah. And, and which is great in itself, and it's something we can talk about after, but there are lawyers that have so much to offer just beyond their, their strict legal skills. And if we find a, an opportunity for them to do it, uh, it can really help solve some of the problems in legal. But, um, you know, to, to look back at this, how excited we are to announce that our team has something 
uh, that we can grow from. We have a lot of the components that our clients are looking for uh, backed by a fabulous team that's moving in the right direction. This to us is, a, we're obviously very proud of this announcement, uh, but certainly to all our users and eventual users, this is just the beginning. Yeah. Definitely. So what is Conductor and w w why did that acquisition happen? Like, mm -hmm. What was that reason? So Conductor is a mature piece of software that was developed by Brian Hunt and his team. Mm -hmm. And it does what we call in layman's terms document generation. So the ability to take pieces of data from a database and turn it into some of the legal documents that need to be generated to update documents. Traditionally, updating a minute book was done in a very... Um, we call it an archaic sort of way of opening up a model or a precedent on Microsoft Word, manually going in and making the changes. Um, and in the best case scenario, it was tedious to do, but in the worst case, you get it wrong. You put in wrong information. And it, it's the sort of thing that, uh, as a law firm, you want to make sure it's done right the first time quickly and efficiently, so you can go focus on far more value-added stuff. So Minutebox had a very robust storage capability. We've just launched our database functionality, and now we also have the ability to generate the documents using that data. So we see it as a very end-to-end -end solution for law firms in terms of getting their uh, information on a cloud-based system that they can access and seamlessly being able to generate all the documents they may need in the future. Yeah, so you acquired, so it says you acquired um, like Conductor. Was mm -hmm. that like a, what was the transaction like? Did you buy them out? Was it a merger? Was it? So uh, I'm, for the purposes, I'm not allowed to get into a lot of the specifics. Definitely. Uh, suffice to say now that we have a fabulous software, an amazing team that's joining us, and everybody's excited to be under the Minute Box brand now. Definitely. That's, uh, so, okay, so getting down to that, I mean, being a lawyer mm -hmm. must definitely help with that process of merging with a company or acquiring a company. Mm -hmm. Because um, traditionally, if like a, found, if a founding team or sorry, a, a startup team is looking to like, you know, acquire another company, buy another company, or do that, they have to go to lawyers. Of course, to do that. Of course, yeah, yeah. right. So, well, it's one of the minutiae I was looking into is like for yourselves, mm -hmm. you guys got to deal structure this, like in a, your own a, internally because mm -hmm. you understand the mechanics of that. Yeah. Do you see this as like a, a tool set you're going to be using to acquire more companies? Do you want to grow in that kind of fashion by acquiring mm -hmm. all these? Uh, companies that um, provide, I guess, uh, value in, the, in your sector? Mm -hmm. um, and, and just to the latter part, in terms of growth strategy, I don't think it's something that we would shy away from. I don't think because we're lawyers, uh, we would necessarily have that strategy. But if we find the right companies that have the right teams to join ours, um, that's always something that we're, uh, we're conscious of. Um, to your first point, having a lawyer um, starting a company is a good thing. Uh, having a group of lawyers getting in a room and, and, and discussing some of the legal matters is, is completely a whole nother side. Uh, not because we don't um, understand how the structure is going to happen, but because there's so many intricacies of a deal yep. and everyone has a different piece of experience um, of either a, a good thing or a bad thing they've come across in their practice. It, it can make going through the minutia a little bit more thorough, we'll call it. Uh, that being said, the fact that we can understand a lot of what's going on is certainly beneficial. Um, especially given that we're in the legal space. So um, we don't handle all of our own legal matters for a whole bunch of obvious reasons, yeah. um, but we can have that conversation with our legal team and, and with our um, uh, whomever it is we're talking to on the other side, uh, such that uh, that conversation could be at a very high level if need be. Yeah, definitely. So do, you do legal teams love working with you or do <laughs> they feel like, okay, this is, I got to tread carefully here. Um, probably a little bit of both. More yeah. than anything else, we're, we're really laid back. We don't always put our legal hats on. Um, in fact, it's something we kind of try and avoid. We're a technology company yeah. uh, devoted to the legal space, but at the same time, just trying to build the best tech company we can for our users. Uh, so most of the time, that's how uh, we're received, especially when it is we're pitching to law firms. But at the same time, we also have that skill set necessary uh, so that we can put on our professional legal hats when we need to. Definitely. So what's your particular role within the company? Now? Yeah, so um, I'm in charge of sales. I'm in charge of business development. Um, when we do things like digitization for certain law firms that only have physical minute books, that's something I run as well. Yep. Um, but perhaps more than anything else, I want to make sure my team can devote their time exclusively to matters uh, that they need to focus on, uh, such as the development, the design. All, I don't want them to deal with the minutia or the tedium of running a company. Uh, and even though that's not necessarily something I love, I love the fact that they don't have to worry about it. Mm. Uh, and so I just take it upon myself to do so it. So they focus on the product and Correct. making it as good, uh, good as possible. Correct. And you go on like, okay, expand your book, line of business. That's right. Yeah, That's right. So it's a very good mix. And it, it's, well, we're not siloed because we speak all the time. Everyone has their particular role. And for the most part, um, we trust one another that they can do everything in that given space to maximize. 
Perfect. So what uh, stage are you at? Are you scaling? Are you, are you on growth mode, trying to onboard customers? Like, or are you still validating your ideas? Um, so we have, turns out, a very good product market fit now. Yeah. Um, we've identified a number of clients that we've started working with earlier in the year that mm -hmm. we've transitioned from pilot to paid. Um, and the beautiful thing about it is now we're starting to get uh, inbound and organic traffic um, because people are starting to use our product. Other law firms are starting to become aware of it, certainly with the announcement of the beta kit. Um, uh, the acquisition of Conductor through BetaKit has led to a lot of interest mm -hmm. in what it is we're developing, um, which is exactly where we want to be. Um, at the same time, we're conscious that we need to do things sort of in lockstep, understand how we can grow, start working with larger and larger clients, because we certainly don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. but we're beginning to realize that everything we've identified in terms of a pain point and potential solution uh, is right on the mark. Perfect. So what's next for you guys? What's the next stages? Like, yeah. Are you guys trying to find a better office, new move around? Like, What's it looking like? For yeah, it's a great question. So uh, we're based on the Legal Innovation Zone, which is an Not incubator DMZ, yeah. exactly associated with the DMZ. And for us, it's a fabulous spot at this stage of our company. Mm -hmm. We're surrounded by legal technologists like ourselves, and we can bounce ideas off each other. Uh, the staff they have is great, and the support they have through <clears throat> um, entrepreneurs and residents, et cetera. Devote, devoted exclusively to something that's very narrow, let's face it, mm -hmm. um, is a perfect place for us to slowly begin to grow and, and sharpen what it is we're building. Um, but in terms of the future, uh, obviously we're looking to expand outside of the jurisdictions that we're currently in, recognizing full well that minute books aren't a specific Canadian problem, uh, but they go well beyond the Canadian borders. And so we're ambitious about the opportunities in the future. But first, we got to make sure we, uh, we can at least ingratiate ourselves with some right partners here in Canada. Perfect. Um, so I guess it goes more to my question, right, about, about growth mode. So this is like a, uh, a problem that many companies have mm -hmm. They reach this unique point where, yeah, they solve a great problem set um, and they end up onboarding clientele they have worked with before, the founding team knows very well, and they start uh, developing a book of business mm -hmm. um, with, cli with clientele that they already understand. Yep. But to grow beyond that requires like a very particular skit, very particular set of skills, mm -hmm. right? From business development, from sales standpoint, to mm -hmm. actually closing the deals, to lead generation. Uh, you need to develop this whole pipeline That's right. to get external clientele, yes. right? So are you still, are you in the process, I guess, of onboarding companies, you have clients you've worked with previously? Mm -hmm. Are you onboarding completely new cli clients? And what's your level of growth, uh, ability to grow? Because yep. some companies have, uh, have to be very careful about their Yes. the growth yep. points as well, right? Absolutely. So we recognized where it is we are and where it is we want to go. And for in order for us to get to that level in the future, we need to plan now. So legal is very much relational at the outset. Mm -hmm. You want to develop that core relationship, that level of trust, especially when you're introducing something that's very new in the legal space. There's naturally a lot of apprehension to undertake something that's novel, even though it can add a lot of value because failure for a law firm, even though Minute books aren't necessarily something they consider to be um, the be all and the end all. They don't want to be in a situation where they've adopted something that just may not work, which is a very rational idea. And so, that at the outset, that relational component is essential. What we've also discovered, however, is that once you do get an idea ingratiated into the mindset of law firms, everybody wants to be on board at an earlier stage. So, it tends to snowball very quickly. And this is before we've even started to roll out our pipeline. This is purely through organic growth. What we had set up, obviously, is a very comprehensive um, sales model through lead generation and then um, developing the sorts of emails and, and automated sort of um, connectors such that we can seamlessly incorporate a whole bunch of new clients in a much shorter timeline. So it's approaching both the traditional legal sales model in a completely different way, understanding what it is they're looking for and what it is we'll need to provide. So. Um, that's a huge difference or differentiator, I think, by what it is we're trying to develop. We're not trying to be a good, small or medium sized company. We're trying to be a massive company that has the ability of working in a very particular industry. Great. OK. <laughs> All right. That's the hope. Fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah. We're still at the early stage, but we have that ambition. Definitely. So what does this look like? What does your growth period look like right now? So you're at Legal Innovation Zone. Mm -hmm. um, do you expect to stay there for, uh, for a few more months or? We're there probably for the next little while at least, uh, simply because uh, it's usually a two-year. Uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's a great place to be. Like I said, it gets me out of the house every day, as opposed to uh, working from my apartment in the first, Definitely. as I did the first year. So yeah. it's certainly nice, nice to change things up. Um, but in terms of like where we would go from there, um, I mean, the good news is that we can 
our system is built on a very jurisdiction agnostic platform. Uh, so once we find the right opportunity to go and expand, uh, I think that's something we'll be very, very conscious of. Definitely. While at the same time continuing to focus with our, our great clients already in Canada. Yeah. So you're focused on, again, Canadian clients right now, um, you know, you know, the U.S., Europe? Like we, we've had actually a lot of, of interest, I'll say, uh, especially from the States, some from Europe, places as far away as Israel and Australia. Um, and so the more research we do about these jurisdictions, the more we find they're suffering from the same pain points. Uh, the good news is that our architecture is built on such a way that it doesn't matter where we are. Uh, and the data can be stored in any jurisdiction. It's a very, very smart way to build the platform. Um, but also we realize we're still a fairly small team. Before we start undertaking huge projects in different jurisdictions, we need to make sure, one, we understand the entirety of their pain points and the solution they're looking for, and two, we can provide them with a level of ongoing support. Um, so it's one thing to have a great client overseas in Europe. Uh, it's another thing um, when, if for whatever reason, they have a question you're not able to answer because it's three in the morning and naturally your whole team is asleep. Yeah. So it, it's, it's an ongoing conversation, but at the same time, we're always looking for the right partners in different jurisdictions throughout Canada and abroad who are interested in trying something new to solve a real pain point they have and are willing to take a little bit of a shot on a company that for the most part can really solve their issues. Yeah. So let's talk about like your um, your onboarding process. Sorry, yep. like uh, your end-to-end -end process, mm -hmm. right? Like, so client, you're onboarding a client. Yes. What is that process like? You go and scan their minute books. You tell me about this, right? Mm -hmm. You actually have specialized equipment. We do. That can actually scan through this. We do. Um, how does that look like? Yeah. So with a process. Uh, in an ideal world, we wouldn't scan a thing. In an ideal world, everything is digitized, and I never have to look at a phys physical minute book again. Yeah. Now that's not an ideal world. Mm -hmm. And so we recognize that there was so much data and information that was associated with physical minute books. And, and it's not because the law firms didn't want digital uh, solutions. It's just that it's very expensive and tedious to do it themselves or even to outsource it to a third party. Uh, so if we wanted to bring on a lot of the traditional law firms, which had all these minute books and all the data, and based on the number of new incorporations that were happening every year, we had to find a way to deal with this physical stuff first. Um, and so through research, uh, through trial and error, we identified key equipment, key processes such that our team can go on and digitize the entirety of a law firm's minute book collection on site at a very, very fast pace. Uh, and we do that in such a way that we can transform the data from physical to digital quickly and then onboard it onto our system. So we've had some law firms, for example, that would tell us, I don't need your service because I already have digital minute books. And by digital, they mean pre-scanned stuff. Uh, that's not really a solution because if it's, if it's just uh, on an internal file system, uh, that's not really solving the tedium that's associated with or providing any value with those minute book documents. So that's not really something that we, we take too much to heart. But if it's already digitized, then it can just be drag and drop onto our platform and, and sorted very easily. So we're conscious of both ways that we can onboard client data. But above anything else, we're, we're a tech company that recognizes the value in, in using this information in a digital way. Um, and that's slowly how we're starting to bring more and more law firms onto it. So, uh, like I said, if a, if a law firm calls me up and they've got physical minute books, I'm there. Mm -hmm. uh, if they call me up and say, I've got virtual minute books, so I need a, a place to put them, we're there as well. Um, and we've been able to uniquely position ourselves as a, a great way to get rid of minute books in the first place. Or that's I should great. say, solve the minute book problem or one of them in the first place. That's great. So. Uh, let's talk about the shock of like working with the tech space. You keep calling yourself a tech company, <laughs> right? So, I mean, how's that transition been from working a, in a law firm, mm -hmm. being a lawyer, and being a founder in a tech company? Mm -hmm. Right, like the culture shifts, the oh, yeah. communication has a change, right? Yeah. So it's funny, when I was working in the corporate space at Osler, I was able to work with a number of early stage companies. So mm -hmm. I dealt with a lot of their incorporations, a lot of their early paperwork. And I suppose as much as you can, you can get some semblance of what it is they're going through on the tech side. Uh, but it is a little bit different actually being on the other side of those conversations uh, where the, you know, the, the effects of decisions that you make have a real impact on the potential success of the company. So the right decisions need to be made uh, at the outset and you need to be conscious of the consequences of it. That's not to say that on the legal side, it's not just as important, but it's one thing to do things for a client. It's another thing to have it done for yourself. Um, now, at the same time, I was a little bit nervous and apprehensive when I joined the, the innovation space, um, forgot legal aside, just as, as an entrepreneur, because I thought I was feeling things that people weren't actually feeling. Things okay. like apprehension, things like fear, um, things like concern for my livelihood, you know, potentially my family in the future. Uh, these were things that were sort of gnawing on me in the back and I didn't really know what to do. Now, 
The great thing about being in a central innovation hub in not just the legal innovation zone, but as part of the DMZ, is you have the chance to interact with a whole bunch of founders from different industries. And it turns out what I was going through, or what I was feeling, was sort of par for the course in terms of what everyone else was feeling. And that's very empowering. Um, because it shows you that, that everyone is human, everyone goes through these same emotions, and there's a level of risk in what we do, but um, simply speaking about it can make you feel a lot better. And now everybody's going to have the ups and everyone's going to have the downs, and being able to share those experiences um, makes it a lot more manageable when you go through those good times and those bad times. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really big issue in the, uh, within entrepreneurship, yep. especially for like first-time uh, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, right, who don't realize the ups and downs that well. Yeah. Especially at the beginning, there's a lot more downs than ups. Yeah. Um, I often liken it to just wading through the mud. Yeah. Uh, and especially at the beginning where it's foggy, you can't even see the other side. And you've got no choice but to keep moving forward. Yeah. It can be scary. Um, you know, failure is a, is a dangerous burden for mm. people to have on their shoulders. Uh, and no one wants to be associated with anything that doesn't work because we all think we have the skills to, to make it happen. And, and sometimes we do, but it, things out of our control. So. You know, that level of worry, it, it's always great to speak with someone. Uh, certainly, we all want to have successful companies, but we also want to hear why some companies weren't successful so we can learn from those experiences and hopefully uh, not mimic those failures. Yeah, so what's the process look like for you to avoid burnout, right? Um, I mean, do you, do you go out and speak to other entrepreneurs? Do you just take the hits and just keep going and try to, like, become stronger from it? Or do you be more systematic, like, I need to, you know, decompress, mm -hmm. focus on this, yeah. Right, like personally, I work out. Yeah. I, I work out like crazy. Um, this is just to clear my mind. That helps. And it yeah. really does. Lifting heavy weights for no reason really can set your mind straight, yeah. and then give you an opportunity to come back and work. Um, you know, the what it is we do. You sort of have to balance the passion and and the forward thinking and the dedication to it with the fact that everything at the end of the day is still just a job and we're human beings and, and need to take care of ourselves both physically and mentally. Um, we're not robots as much as sometimes entrepreneurs we like to think we are. And so um, healthy body, healthy mind and healthy attitude are things that are necessary. And again, I'm still trying to figure all of this out. Uh, if ever I'm, I'm resting and figure perhaps I should be focused more on my company, uh, there's a little tinge of guilt, but that's becoming less and less. <laughs> um, especially now that we're starting to see a little bit of excitement happen in terms of uptake and our product. This is what we worked so hard for. So we really take pleasure in those small victories. <laughs> um, and we remember them every time things get a little bit difficult. And that helps. Yeah. No, definitely. So I mean, coming from a legal background, like you, I assume you've been more, of, uh, more systematic in the way you operate. <laughs> right? So I talk to founders about this all the time. Um, so we generally founders fall within like a, into in a rate in a spectrum. Yep. Right. I, I find um, between visionaries, people who sees a solution to a, a great problem, mm -hmm. like you know they see the mountaintop and they're haunted by this vision of what could be, mm -hmm. and no matter what they do, they're drawn towards this. Versus an operator, right? Someone who's more systematic, who builds something, who either sees or finds opportunity but doesn't necessarily get chase it or haunted by it. They just like build towards it because they mm -hmm. see the opportunity and what they can do out of it. Mm -hmm. And people generally fall within this range between one or two, um, with co-founders being on one end, the other being the other end. Mm -hmm. Where would you find yourself falling on this? Myself? Between the th yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. I would say, in my mind, I've developed a vision for the way the legal world should be. And mm -hmm. it wasn't myself just jotting notes, it was through the readings, through the lectures, and, and through the people I had connected with. Um, certain things we would like to see improved in the legal space, and if I can be a part of those improvements, uh, that would make for a successful career for me. So I guess I could see that pinnacle, that striving for it. I, I really love the space and I want to be the one who can help move it in the right direction. At the same time, I also understand the world that we're living in, in terms of the legal space. It needs to be done in lockstep. It needs to be done slowly, um, slowly boiling the water so as not to get anybody too fearful about the radical changes that are happening. Uh, so I'm sure you get this a lot where people sort of say, I'm in the middle, I do a little bit of everything. Yep. Um, but I would say now, more than anything else, I'm more motivated and excited to reach for that peak because I know it's something I think that... So I'm, you seem like you're floating towards the visionary angle? Very much so. Yep. Um, Whereas at the beginning, I, I, I would probably be a little bit more on the uh, operational side of how to do it. And part of that is, is I have such confidence in my team that we have the ability to handle all matters both on the operational side and on the visionary side that 
I'm allowing myself to have a little bit of more of a sway in, in one over the other. Uh, and we have the slack to, to trust one another to, to pick up wherever it is we need. And being the one in charge of sales, right, you have to be the visionary that sees the complete vision, the picture, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, without and once you see that, once you can start, you can start projecting it, mm -hmm. right? Part of the sales, part of that sales is selling the dream, right? Not just a direct solution, A to B solution, but yeah. saying this is how it could be. That's right. Um, how has that transition been like? Because you guys offer a pretty solid solution to a pretty mm -hmm. deep problem, mm -hmm. but the infrastructure changes, the the process changes that comes with it, mm -hmm. right? I mean, is there resistance? Is there like a lot of training required? Mm -hmm. Do you find yourself being Okay, we've completed the sales cycle, but part of the onboarding is like we're stuck in the minutia of training these staff on how to use this better. Yeah. Uh, does it happen a lot? Um, it does and it doesn't. So the system was designed as a modern cloud uh, SaaS based solution. So it's incredibly intuitive and, and usually the best feedback we get, and we've had it from a number of our clients, is it's easy to use. I feel like I've used it before, okay. which is a great starting yeah. point. But it's a huge transition from going from a, a physical system in most cases, or I will call it a very um, rudimentary digitization system to one now where everything is officially cloud-based and so the knee-jerk is to access a new system that they may uh, for their minute book documents they may not have been aware of before so there is a little bit of um, acclimatizing or acclimating to that new system and it does require us to produce things like videos or um, on-site visits uh, which we're happy to do because we recognize that these are the law firms or, or individuals who are going to provide us with the most feedback in order for us to build the best product. So it's, it's something we're absolutely happy to do. But the sales cycle from when you commence that conversation to when they're fully onboarded, there's no short way around it. It's going to take some time. You just have to make sure everybody in the process, uh, in the decision making, uh, in the law firm or accounting firm or large corporation understands the value of what it is you're building and everyone has the idea of moving forward together. That at least removes some of the resistance in terms of introducing a new solution, but at the same time we recognize that it, it will take a, li a little time, or depending on the firm. The good news is that uh, no one has said what you're doing is crazy and we don't want to see it. Everyone seems to agree that this is the direction the industry is going in and it's something that they want to be a part of. So then it's just a matter of finding the right partners at the right time uh, in order to transition from traditional minute books to a more modern way. Great. Um, so let's, my big question, this is one thing I like asking to sure. founders, right? It's like, what is the biggest problem you guys are facing right now yeah. or are dealing with? Yeah. Um, to be honest, I don't know if we're actually facing any big problems. There are certain hurdles that are going to exist no matter what we do, and that is, for the most part, the sales cycle, which tends to be a lot longer. Um, but there are ways to slowly chisel away at that with a, a much more active pipeline, and, and um, as you, certainly myself on the sales side, I get sharper in terms of our presentations and uh, the ability to identify exactly what individuals are looking for as I present to them, that will slowly reduce over time. But I haven't yet woken up in the morning and think we're having this problem right now. Um, unless we solve it, we're all in big trouble. And I think that's a good thing. But at the same time, we're always conscious that uh, the state we're in right now can always change. Yeah. Um, so again, we're conscious of those larger problems, uh, sales cycle, uh, et cetera. But um, they're not right now pressing such that uh, if we don't solve them, we'll be in big trouble. Okay. What about any like particular small problems, right? Like a three-person, now six-person team. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't need to do so much still, right? Especially if your specialties don't lie in different areas, mm -hmm. like marketing, yeah. right? For instance, maybe the financials you're a little yeah. better at, right? But is there any particular skill sets you're trying to fill in right now? So right now, uh, and again, this, this goes towards the value of my team and ability of people to wear a number of different hats. Uh, we've got a lot that's covered. Um, that doesn't mean that we're sufficient in terms of when we enter our growth phase that we're gonna be able to manage all of this, in fact, um, right now, we're starting to see that even through the beta kit article, there's quite a lot of interest in what it is we're developing. And over time, as we convert those from um, interest to pilot to paid, that will, um, that will bring on a much larger burden that our team of six just won't be able to handle. Mm -hmm. So we're conscious of what needs to be added over time. But I would say we've got a great team right now that's able to manage the level of incoming work that we have coming and as well as be able to generate organically uh, more work in the future. Um, but again, we know that if we're going to be as big as we want to be, it's going to require more manpower. Yeah. So the risk of bringing in a buzzword into Please, the conversation, love buzzwords. right? Blockchain is a huge concept right now. Mm -hmm. And minute book seems like trying to, uh, data that requires to be securitized and, yep. and uh, leisured in, I mm -hmm. guess, into like 
uh, where a blockchain kind of technology could be beneficial in there. Yep. Is there any play towards that? So without getting too much into the details of our platform, there is a cryptographic hashing system okay. uh, in order to uh, both monitor and preserve the minute books. Um, but I will tell you, on the sales side, the idea of introducing a blockchain system is not as simple a revolutionary as one might think in terms of bringing on new clients. Remember, in the legal space, it's still very traditional. Yeah. Um, and we're selling a lot of very, to very seasoned lawyers who have been doing the same thing for a long time. Yeah. And suddenly introducing them to the idea of blockchain, um, where their minute books are stored or their information is stored, it's not that they wouldn't be, or they would be averse to that idea, it's that they simply don't understand it. So I had one lawyer tell me, um, I don't want to, I don't want to see this, or sorry, one lawyer had asked me, put it on blockchain, and I said no. And they said, why? And I said, because you'll be the only one who does it. Uh, I don't necessarily want, and in fact, it's happened a few times where a lawyer has asked me, how many bitcoins is it going to cost me to see my minute books? And that education component, while it's, while it's important, um, shouldn't be the focus of whether or not someone transitions from a physical to a digital minute book. Yeah. Um, so we're conscious of the language we use when we inform everybody about how their information is stored, how there'll be access to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we provide a lot of the technical components that are associated with our security and privatization, uh, while they would be able to eventually understand it and digest it, it may not be the best to start a conversation at the outset. We don't believe that will be the decision uh, or, or that will be the first thing for which they make the decision. It may be the last thing, in which case we've got all the technology for secure and information, uh, secure and private information, but that's not necessarily the um, this, the uh, the first thing we uh, we throw into the boat. Great, great. So you're still on. Okay, you validated your idea. You're about to hit the growth mode, and no real great problem sets that you're facing. That Again, touch wood here. I can't yeah. stress that enough. Yeah, no real like <laughs> major problem sets. So. You guys are not really on the cruise mode, but you're more on, okay, we're just being very systematic and careful what we're doing. Mm -hmm. You're now on board at a new co company. Like, are you, are you gonna be hiring soon? Are you gonna be expanding the team? Um, I think right now we're gonna wait until, uh, see the reception we get from some clients. And as we start converting some of those much larger contracts, then inevitably we're gonna have to do it. Uh, at the same time, we've got great networks of people both on the engineering side, uh, front end, back end development, and certainly myself on the sales side, people from legal and non-legal, that we're conscious of the sorts of people we would want to hire, and we're always receptive to like new people. Like scalability for you. Yeah. I mean, a lot of your touch points seem to be face-to-face. -face, At right? the outset. At the outset? At the outset, certainly. Ev eventually, it's gonna be automated to be more. That's right, that's right. So. Whereas there perhaps will always be some need to have a face-to-face -face conversation, in the future it may not need to be me. We could have people in different jurisdictions doing it that both represent the company and understand it, uh, which I'm totally great with as long as they share my same passion for minute books, uh, which there aren't too many people who do, but uh, they do exist out there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, it's a complete understanding of the direction we want to go in, but at the same time we don't want to be too overburdened now with staff that we may not necessarily have uh, much for them to do or be able to specifically focus on that one area. Um, but if things progress the way we hope they will, uh, there'll be plenty of work for everybody. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Sean, it's been an hour. And <laughs> this conversation I, flew right by. I uh, can't believe it. Uh, right. Uh, thank you again for coming on and getting to the minutia of, you know, being a professional starting um, a company and the details behind that. Uh, wish you guys the best. Thank and, you very uh, definitely much. Definitely we'll stay in touch. Absolutely. And um, I'd love to monitor your progress and uh, see how you guys continue. We're very excited about the direction we're going in and hopefully this is the first of many conversations in the future. Absolutely. Next time we'll have better news. Yeah.